Welcome to Bishop Barron Presents. I'm Jared Zimmer, the Senior Director of the Word on Fire Institute. And in this episode, Bishop Barron sits down with Dr. Larry Chapp, a theologian and educator with specialization in resource month theology. In this conversation, Bishop and Larry talk about the Catholic worker movement, traditionalism and liberalism in the Catholic Church, as well as the Second Vatican Council. Unfortunately, due to a series of delayed flights and canceled flights, I was unable to join this conversation, but it's a fantastic one and I hope you enjoy. Well, Dr. Larry Chapp, delighted to be with you today. I've known you for a little while. We met uh, some years ago, and then we worked together on a book on Ben Balthazar. I did a how Balthazar chapter. changed my mind. Exactly. Yes. So yes. that's how I knew you. But you came recently on my radar screen when a couple of my Word on Fire uh, colleagues came to me and said, "There's this fellow writing this blog, and it's real smart, and it's a little edgy, and it's funny, and he's defending you against a lot of your critics." I said, "Really? Who's that?" They said a guy named Larry Chap. I said, I know Larry Chap. We've worked <laughs> on some things over the years. So then I became a pretty uh, passionate reader of Gaudium et Spes 22, your blog, which I really do admire. And uh, one thing I've noticed, of course, now reading you a lot, is you and I, are, I think, are exactly the same age. Uh, we came of age at the same time in the church. Uh, namely, no experience of the preconciliar. We all came of nope. age after Vatican II. We lived through the silly season, you know, 65 through about 80 or so. I remember a priest in full vestments coming up the middle aisle for Mass on a motorcycle. So, I mean, yes. we lived through that kind of stuff. Then the heroic papacy of John Paul II and the sort of the continuation of it with Benedict XVI. We've experienced the reemergence of the sort of radical traditionalists on the other side of the spectrum who are now going after Vatican II. And then we both landed, it seems to me, in a similar place, which is the ressourcement reading of Vatican II that holds off this yeah. sort of crazy progressivism and crazy radtradism. And so I, I just, you know, I've talked about that, written about it. I want to hear you talk about it, how you got to that particular place, defending Vatican II from the ressourcement standpoint, and why that matters to you, especially now. Oh boy, there's a lot. There's a lot in there, uh, but we do share a, a very similar personal narrative in the terms yeah. of the times that we lived through, and it was the silly season. And I just always assumed that everybody agreed with me that the papacies of John Paul and Benedict represented the proper hermeneutic of the Second Vatican Council, right. Resourcement theology, and that this was the way forward. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you see the emergence of the, and likewise too that theologians like Hans Urs von Balthasar that I did my dissertation on were also part and parcel of this, this, this bastion of, of sort of how to magisterially retrieve the council. Then imagine my surprise when you see this upswing yeah. of these radical traditionalists. A friend of mine, Philippa Martyr in Australia, calls them tradicals, and I, yeah. I, I love that phrase, the tradicals that, uh, oh, John Paul is squishy, and Benedict is, even despite some more pontificum, is squishy. And obviously Balthazar is a heretic because he thinks everybody's going to heaven. And now Vatican II is called into question because it allowed for changing the liturgy. And, uh, and, and I, I started reading this, and at first I was very dismissive of it. Yeah, but yeah. then I started, I started getting little notes from seminary formators and people, mm -hmm. even though I started a Catholic worker farm, I still had, you know, colleagues and so on in that world who would say, you have no idea yeah. how much yeah. in the YouTube sphere and in the blogosphere, these tradicals, the radical traditionalists are influencing young, mm -hmm. devout Catholics, especially, and this is what got my interest, young seminarians. Yeah. And that they were all becoming quite enamored of this new narrative of, John Paul, Benedict, Balthazar, uh, de Lubac, these guys are all part of the problem. They're all modernists. We just need to get rid of all of them and roll the clock back to 1955. It's a bit of a simplistic caricature, but that is what they want to do. And so I had all these friends saying, chap, start a blog. Because, you know, I've kissed the Blarney Stone and I can talk some talk. And, and, and they would say, you need this. And I said, a blog. Everybody's got a blog. Right. Nobody, we, last thing in the world we need is another blog. But, you know, I, I thought, okay. So I, I, I wrestled with a title, and I came up with Gaudium et Spes 22, and we can talk about why the title, yeah. and, and just started writing. And my wife, uh, Dr. Carrie Chapp, who you've also met, uh, said, don't write unless you have something to say. Mm -hmm. And that was the best advice that I ever got. Because people will notice I only blog once every two weeks, yeah. you know, because I only blog when I have something to say. And 
it struck a chord because there was nothing out there defending resource mon theology, defending John Paul, defending Benedict, defending Balthazar de Lubac. Nothing. There is in scholarly works, but very yeah. little beyond what some of the things that you do yeah. uh, out there. You know, it's interesting. When you and I were coming of age, so you were in the seminary for a time. So oh, our yeah. Our paths diverged. Time. You, you went yeah. into married life. I became a priest. But we are in the seminary for around the same time. Yeah. If you wanted to read Baltazar, de Lubac, Ratzinger, uh, Wojtyla back in those days, you practically had to do it under covers with a flashlight. I mean, <laughs> literally. Uh, because... You know, the, the Renian theology was very much Rahner, it was Skilebex, it was Hans Kung, it was, it was um, you know, the, the standard liberal voice of the day. Yeah. And I was very much trained in that theology. I remember in the seminary, if you're looking at a particular issue, you'd often begin with the Bible, and you'd look at that witness, then you'd look at the church fathers, you'd look at Aquinas, and then you'd look at Rahner. And Rahner pretty much settled the, the debate, you know, yeah. that all the truth has kind of come to Rahner. Uh, so when you started diverging from that, as, as I did, questioning the sort of liberal consensus, and you embraced people like de Lubac and so on, that was making you, at that time, an arch-conservative. Which is why, again, I found it so almost like head-shakingly puzzling when <laughs> the rad trads today are looking at those very same people I know. as dangerous radicals and modernists. I mean, on the contrary, these are the people who are most opposed to, to modernism and were opposed to Catholic progressivism. And so how do you find that place? And I understand, I'm a Newman man. The truth isn't always just you know, blandly in the middle. But in fact, there is a place in between the progressivism that we both came to repudiate, yeah, because it just caves into the culture too much. When we were kids, you know, uh, the world sets the agenda for the church. That was a, a, a oh, yeah. slogan. I mean, that's a terrible slogan. I mean, it's getting the church completely, completely backward. Uh, so that side, hugely problematic. But then this other thing that emerged is not the answer either. And doing what John Paul II and, and Ratzinger uh, tried to do is, in fact, where we still have to fight the fight. That's still where, you know, we have to defend that ground. And uh, so we found ourselves in that same trench, don't we? Yeah, we, we did. And uh, I went to uh, uh, Mount St. Mary's Seminary in Emmitsburg, oh, right. Maryland, yeah. which was well known to be, a, you know, an orthodox, yeah. relatively conservative seminary. Yeah. And yet my experience was very much the same. Mm -hmm. When I was there in the early 1980s, it was runner, 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 runner. Right. And I didn't get a ton of opposition if I wanted to read De Lubach and Balthazar, but you're doing that on your own, chap. Yeah, you're yeah. certainly not going to learn it from us. And if you want to ring, read that right-wing stuff, you go right ahead. But, but yeah. the, I met the, the deepest resistance to Balthazar uh, when I wanted to do my doctoral dissertation and when I was at yeah. Fordham University in the early 90s, which was at the time dominated by liberal Ranarians, not just Jesuits, but the entire department. And I had to fight tooth and nail to do a dissertation on Balthazar, which I eventually did. But that's why, too, and I, 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 it so deeply resonates with what you just said, how it took me a long time to finally let it sink in that there's an entire rising universe of people out there that actually think Balthazar is some kind of progressive, liberal, and all the resource Mont guys are modernists and liberals. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. And I, I was on a slow learning curve and catching up to what was going on. Yeah, I didn't get it either for a while. I was surprised, frankly, when I, I came across some of these blog sites and YouTube yeah. videos. I thought, oh, really? They're, they're that extreme? They, they think the council was a huge mistake? Uh, Karl Wojtyla, Josef Ratzinger, preeminently men of the council. They felt there was a, a real problematic interpretation of it, but they were men of the council. They wouldn't hold to this, you know, repudiation of Vatican II, which is why I think the, the rad treads are, I've called them self-devouring Catholics. If the, the progressives are more, I've called them beige Catholics, yeah. you know, so you, you've lost a lot of the distinctive color of Catholicism, you've lost its distinctive message. But the other side is self-devouring, because the minute you say, well, you know, the, our current pope is not really the pope, the Vatican Council is not a legitimate <laughs> yeah. council, well, you're undermining, you're sawing off the branch you're sitting on. You're trying to be a Catholic traditionalist, but you're denying key elements of the Catholic tradition. So I do think that's where the fight is engaged today. And I would call upon more and more people to get into it. And I furthermore agree with you that it worries me about seminarians. I was a seminary guy for a long time, a teacher yeah. and then a rector. And that does concern me, if, if they're being drawn to the more rad-trad side of the, of the equation. It's still worth fighting the John Paul fight. 
Yeah, it, it is. And there are also, it's not just about resource month theology or the council. It seems to me that in the rise of the traditionalists, there's this desire to go back and to retrieve, not just to reject, but to retrieve a certain form of theology uh, that was that was bypassed for a reason. Yeah. And, and certain troubling and problematic doctrines, such as attempting to retrieve some version of the Massa Damnata, some version of the idea of a very narrow reading of extra ecclesia nulla solis, mm -hmm. that there really isn't that much salvation outside. Yeah, I, you gave a homily a while back where you spoke about yeah. salvation outside of the church, and you just said what Lumen Gentium says. What the church, I thought it was great, a nice, basic, inclusive Christology, if I may use the word inclusive these days, uh, without repercussions. But the, 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 the fact is then all this blowback that you got for that, does he not know that Christ is the only way to... I mean, and, and you sit back and you say, and I'm not going to name names, but that you know who they are. And they were, they were some well-known names out there giving their response videos saying, well, you need to remember that, yeah, there's salvation outside of the church, but it's still really tough. Yeah, right. It's really difficult. I wrote a blog post where I said it's almost, it, to me, it's, it's very similar to the old um, voter suppression in, in the Jim Crow days where, you, yeah, they have the right to vote, but they have to do this, 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 and this before they can, which meant essentially they can't. So, yeah, they can get salvation outside of the church if bing, 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 bing. Yeah. And then you realize, well, so you're saying that only Catholics go to heaven and most people go to hell. And they'll scream bloody murder and accuse you of attacking a straw man and a caricature of their position. Uh, when you point these things out, but it's absolutely true. And I find this, I was talking to one of your staff people before we went on, and I agree. There's an element of violence mm -hmm. in this view, I think. There, there's an undercurrent of some kind of animosity, anger, a level of violence that I haven't yet completely analyzed. Uh, but there are decidedly important reasons why the church has moved away from overly narrow readings of extra ecclesium, mm -hmm. and therefore overly expansive views of, of, of damnation. And I, I, and I blogged a lot about this, and I, I, to me it's one of the more troubling things, because it cuts right to the heart of your ministry and what I'm trying to do, evangelization. Yeah. Because one of their claims is that you can't evangelize because you won't have the motivation to evangelize unless you believe there's a lot of people in hell. Yeah, which I think is, is so much nonsense. It's, it's utter... It's utter nonsense. Right, but you find that a lot in the rhetoric, that unless you heat up hell and you insist there are a lot of people in it, uh, no one's going to take you seriously. And I right. would say on the contrary. One thing I appreciated very much in, in your blogging is I think any good evangelist would say, of course I'm trying to get people out of hell. Hell begins here as heaven begins here. Yes. I mean, hell is, hell is sin. Hell is self-absorption. Hell is being in curvatus in se, as Augustine said. Hell is being in the grip of the libido dominandi. I mean, yes. hell is it now. It's here. It's now. And so whenever you declare the gospel, whenever you declare Jesus Christ, you're, you're trying to get people out of that. You're trying to move them into a different place. So I, I wouldn't hesitate for a minute to say, yeah, that's my whole purpose is to get people out of hell. But I'd also say this. My motivation is the Lord Jesus Christ said, go and preach to all nations. So there wasn't yeah. there an explicit reference to, well, now the main thing I want you to be concerned about is getting them out of hell. It's, he said, go preach. Preach the good news. Okay, I'm going to go and preach. Now, an effect of that indeed is to draw people out of these hellish situations they're in. Of course, as I want. The eschatological, the ultimate sense of hell, I mean, I'll leave that to God. But yeah. my job, as I see it, is to offer the good news to people, you know. Uh, and as I think you said somewhere else, I mean, why wouldn't I just close up shop if I really believe that? that yeah. Um, oh, Head off sure, to the beach and... Sure, heck, everyone's saved, so I'll just you know, give this whole project up. Well, I haven't, which should tell you something about uh, my conviction on that score, you know. Um, let's talk about Baltar a little bit more yeah. because um, he's a, you know, a key player in this process. Um, we had that first contact through the book that you wrote on how Baltar changed my mind. And... Um, he did indeed change my mind. As I was trained, as I mentioned, in the more liberal Ranarian tradition, beginning with experience and then trying to correlate experience to doctrine, it's kind of a Schleiermacher approach. It's a Paul Tillich approach. Um, I learned it as a very practical theological reflection method. You know, so yeah, you begin yeah. with people and you'd say, well, remember a time when you felt very close to God and then give me an image that calls that to mind. And now from that image derive a doctrine of the church that names it for you well. What's going on there is experience 
sort of governs the process. You correlate experience to doctrine. It's the Schleiermacher, more liberal approach. And when I read people like Balthazar, it was the beginning of a great Copernican revolution. Because the danger with the Schleiermacher thing is experience reads the Bible. Experience sets the tone. The tail wags the dog. Right. And as, as Bard said, look at any of the Socratic dialogues. It's the guy that asks the questions that, that runs the conversation. So you say, <laughs> hey, yeah. I'm going to ask all the questions. They come from experience. Balthazar, like Bard, who is a mentor in many ways to him, the opening up of the great biblical space which is a, it's a new world, it's a, it's a world of, of fresh experience and it's a world of revelation, then determines my experience in a, in a fresh way. It, it makes me sense things differently. I'm not controlling the Bible by my experience, but now my experience is being drawn into the world of the Bible. That's what I found compelling in Balthazar. Yes. So that, that was yes. the sort of the fundamental thing with him. Um, you know, one of his teachings is the, you know, Famously, dare we hope, though, as, as you say, Was correctly, wir the what German is better. I, what may we hope? Yeah. Maybe. Um, you know, I, I get where the dare we hope comes from. It's like, you know, what, what are the extravagant limits of this hope that we <laughs> yeah. might have? But the German is, is more um, sober. You know, what, yeah. what may we hope for? And the answer seems to be, well, you know, given the biblical witness and given the, the uh, great tradition with its, its you know, multivalent expressions, that we may hope, we may hope for the salvation of all. But I, along with Balthazar, I always thought of that minimalistically, not maximalistically. Oh, yeah. That's to say, yeah, we, we may hope for this. Do I know it? No. no. That would be a universalism, you know, tout court. But I, I may hope. To me, that's a, that's a minimalist sort of claim. The trouble is the critics <laughs> read it maximalistically. Yeah. Therefore, you hold, obviously, everyone's in heaven, no need to worry, uh, case closed. Yeah. No, I, I, it's minimalist, not maximalist. Yeah, and they explicitly ignore vast swaths of what Balthazar writes right. on, on that topic. And right. A lot of them don't read him at all, unfortunately, where he makes it quite clear that he's not a universalist and so on. But, you know, it, be that, I mean, if I may indulge your viewers with a story of my own as to how Balthazar yeah. changed my mind, I've told this story to a lot of my friends. They're sick of hearing it. Uh, but when I was a young man, I went to minor seminary too, and yeah. my minor seminary was in northern Kentucky. It was a very conservative place, and we were actually in the 1970s still learning from the old neo-scholastic manuals. And I was very, very, very uh, feeling hemmed in by these things, and I was a precocious young little nerd, <laughs> library rat kind of guy, and I was pouring into these things thinking, there must be answers to my questions in here, and there wasn't. So I went to my spiritual director, this convert from Judaism, a guy named Father Anton Morgenroth, a holy mm. spirit priest, and uh, looked like Alfred Hitchcock and Leonard Bernstein combined, and <laughs> he uh, was sitting in his easy chair eating sausages, and I was telling my tale of woe, and he said, okay, they, they are done here, and at the same time next week, I said, okay, well, I guess that's it, and after all that, and so I start to leave, and he says, wait a minute, goes to his shelf, pulls off a copy of Balthazar's Love Alone, mm -hmm. throws it across the room at me, I catch it, he goes, yeah, read that, it'll make you less stupid, <laughs> and, and I did, I went and devoured it that night, it did make me less stupid, and uh, I, it opened me up to exactly what I felt now drawn yeah. into, yeah. I felt drawn into an entire universe. And so I went back to Father Morgan and I said, show me more. And then we started reading. De Lubac, Guardini, Bouillet, yeah. oh, Congar, all of these guys. And I thought, where have they been my yeah. own? So this was liberating to me right. intellectually. An, an intellectual movement rooted deeply, deeply in the tradition in a way that the neo-scholastics were not. And we don't want to unnecessarily trash the neo-scholastics. They were good in their way. But they were not broad enough, and there had to be a deeper retrieval, and I was thirsting for it. And I still think that that theology would work today, yeah. does work today, is the only theology that will work today. Yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, I'm a Thomist by training and background, love Thomas Aquinas, but I had the great grace when I was in Paris getting my doctorate. My director was a guy named Michel Corbin, uh, still alive, great Jesuit scholar of Anselm especially, but Thomas too. But he was a student, he, Corbin, of de Lubac himself. And so he took in that ressourcement, Balthazarian, patristic tradition. Right. What we did in all the seminars at the Institut Catholique with Corbin, we'd read Aquinas typically, 
but then we read them in light of the fathers. We would read them in an Augustinian way. We would yes. read them in a in a pseudo Dionysian way. We would read them in a, a a Bernardine way. So we love Saint Bernard, who was very patristic. So I learned. One thing is not to drive a wedge between Thomas and the fathers. In fact, Thomas is, is you know, fed by the fathers in almost every detail. And to read that sort of uh, medieval scholasticism, but in light of an earlier, much more biblical and patristic uh, tradition. And that, to me, opened up a world and made someone like Balthazar possible. And Corbin opened doors to Balthazar for me. Oh, yeah, and I, uh, I love Aquinas as well, and that is why I'm very... I'm very fond of telling people, very, very insistent on telling people here, that race source mon theology is not opposed to Thomas yeah, at all. Right. In fact, Balthazar quotes Aquinas more than any other author in his trilogy. He thinks that his real distinction is the greatest philosophical mm-hmm. breakthrough in the history of thought, he uses it against Heidegger. But more importantly, I, I would like people to understand the race source mon theology is a form of Thomism. Mm-hmm. This is what was going on in the middle part of the 20th century. Yeah. The neo-scholastic hegemony was such, especially in seminaries, and this is a lot what we're talking about here, is really what was going on in seminary formation. There was a real hegemony of a certain kind of Thomistic yeah. discourse. But then, as Tracy Rowland points out in her fantastic book, mm-hmm. Catholic Theology, she goes through a list of about nine or ten different Thomisms, that were floating around in the middle part of the... Rahner was a kind sure, of Thomas. transcendental Thomas. The, the transcendental Thomas. You had the existential Thomas of Gilson and others. You had phenomenal And the race of Osman guys kind of represented a patristic Thomas. Yeah, right. All right. As you were just alluding to. So this mythology that has suddenly emerged now of, you know, the resource Mont guys threw Aquinas out is so historically inaccurate. Yeah, but unfortunately in the years after the council, as you know, Thomas was kind of jettisoned. You yeah. Know? So when we were coming of age... Thomas meant for a lot of people, oh, that's Garigou Lagrange's Thomas. That's the yeah. old neo-scholastic Thomas. The council got rid of him. When you're, you're dead right, it didn't get rid of him. It read him in a broader context, in a richer scriptural and patristic context. That's how I look at someone like de Lubac. Yeah. Uh, look at de Lubac's work on, on Aquinas, on, on nature, grace, and all that. I mean, he, he mm-hmm. knows more Aquinas than most people have forgotten. You know? So, <laughs> I know. Uh, and I like Garigou, too, by the way, Garigou yeah. Brush. I mean, but, you know, it was limited, that's all. It was just yeah. quite limited. So that's still the battle intellectually we have to keep fighting, I think, is to find this integrated approach that takes in the whole of the tradition, you know, very yeah. richly. And it's part of the, the falling apart we have today, though, that we have to, you know, battle against. But Balthazar meant a lot of that to me. He opened up those doors. Yeah. Um, you know, the hell question is funny. Uh, I was speaking up at Thomas Aquinas College, which is in my region here. And yeah. I go up occasionally just to have dinner with the kids and I have a Q&A. So in the course of the Q&A, this is a couple years ago, one of the students said, uh, we know, Bishop, you're probably best known for your views on hell. And I said, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Before you go on with that question, I said, I've written about 20 books. I've written uh, hundreds of articles. I've done th- a thousand videos. I've done maybe two videos on the question of universal salvation. I said, please, I am not best known. I mean, maybe I am in certain circles best known for that, but that is not anywhere near the center of my thinking. It's never been a preoccupation of any of my books. And the same is true of Balthazar, you know, as though that's somehow central to Balthazar's uh, theological It's way downstream. Right. Right. It's, it's very much downstream. I mentioned in one of my blog posts, I said, I, I haven't dealt a great deal on this topic because, quite frankly, I'm not interested in eschatological census taking. And right. I don't think that's what the statements of Christ in the New Testament are about. And that's not what Balthazar is about. But if you must talk about it, okay, here are my views. Now let's move on. Yeah. One way I've done it, I said, Balthazar, I think, kind of originized Augustine. And what I meant there was, he knows origins of Pacatastas is, yeah. is too strong, I mean, like a too yeah. frank universalism. But he did bring, let's say, some of that, some of Gregory, some of, of Maximus the Confessor, people he knew very well from the East, to at least moderate the Massa Damnata sort of view of Augustine. And yeah. I think that was, a, in my mind, in light of Newman, a good example of the development of doctrine. Uh, you know, taking elements from different parts of the tradition and, and if you want, softening a bit the Masa Damnata, because I think that backs us into all sorts of dangerous corners, you know. So yeah, to does. me, the, the dare we hope that all be saved is a, is a very moderate position and, and one that, that honors different dimensions of the tradition around this question. It really does. And uh, I mean, I like something you said earlier about, about hell and the fact that we're, we're sort of 
in, a, in, a, in an inchoate way, we're already in yeah. hell now. I, I wrote in one of my blogs, the essence of our message should not be, believe this or you're going to go to hell. Right. Believe this and you'll come out of hell. Yeah, that's right. You yeah. know, that, that's, that's the essence of it here. And that's the essence of the Balthazarian message as well. I've got good news for you. Yeah, absolutely. I've got good the, news the, for you. And then he proceeds in this massive trilogy and all these ancillary writings to unpack the most beautiful image of Christ that I think is out there. That's why I'm a Balthazarian. Mm -hmm. I have not yet found a, a more beautiful image yeah. of Christ than the one that you find in Balthazar. And I cannot understand how anybody would find that not compelling. Uh, yeah. short, short of some fear that I'm going to go to hell unless I believe some, like I lost out on the religion lottery and got the wrong answer, you know. Yeah. Let's talk a bit more about the related issue of um, evangelizing and evangelizing outside the confines of the church. An example is that uh, interview I did with uh, with Ben Shapiro some years ago. It got a strong reaction. <laughs> yes, uh, I I love that interview. I remember you know coming out of it, and I thought we talked about a number of interesting things, and I thought it was fascinating. But of course, what certain people seized upon was my suggestion <laughs> that when what Shapiro asked me was, "Okay, look, I'm a I'm an Orthodox Jew." Does that mean, from your perspective, I'm screwed? I That's screwed? the way he put it. Right, yeah. And my answer, which was informed by Lumen Gentium 16, was no. That Christ, you know, is, is, the, is the fullness of salvation. Christ is what salvation means. But yet there are participations in various, you know, religious and philosophical traditions. And you can be, you know, not will be, not I know it, not don't worry about it. But it's, yeah. it's possible. But what, here's what I think is really interesting, though, that people tended to miss. That's Lumen Gentium 16. That's kind of, to me like sort of standard church teaching. But what they missed was I very actively evangelized Ben Shapiro in that interview because what I talked about was Christ, the fulfillment of Israel. So you go beyond that question. Yes. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'm not dealing here with a, an atheist. I'm not talking to a secularist. I'm not talking to someone vaguely wondering about God. I'm talking to a committed believer in God. More to it, someone that is ardently part of the mother tradition of Christianity. So the evangelical style uh, is different. What I did was I think what Paul did when he went into synagogues in the first century, yes. namely to say to Jews, here's the fulfillment. Here's the one who's the yes to all the promises made to Israel. Uh, let's talk about uh, covenant and temple and law and prophecy, and I want you to see how this Yeshua from Nazareth is the yes to all those promises. So that's what I did with Ben Shapiro. Uh, do people really think if I'd come in with a hammer and just said, Ben, unless yeah. you repudiate the faith you've got and become a Roman Catholic explicitly, you will go to hell, that that would have been an efficacious method of evangelization. I would, I would submit no. I, I, I would submit that most of them would not do that yeah. because they have more prudence and, and sense than what they might say yeah. in a YouTube response to you. Unfortunately, I think there are some out there yeah. who, who would have spoken to Ben Shapiro like this. Now, I said to some people, too, and I think I mentioned in a blog, uh, that something that, that you've just actually anticipated what I wanted to say about the Ben Shapiro interview, what they forget is the fact that Ben Shapiro is Jewish. Mm -hmm. And when you have a, a Jewish, a, a real believing Jew as your interlocutor as a Catholic, there are, there's a multi-layered response mm -hmm. that you have to engage in. Yeah. And not just because of the fulfillment motif, but because of history. Yeah, that's right. That's because right. of history. And we need to be constantly reminded that we have not always been so kind to our Jewish <laughs> brothers right. and sisters. And that there is an issue there, therefore, that one does have to pay attention to, that one wouldn't necessarily have to pay attention if I'm just talking to yeah. a garden variety New Ager or yeah, that's right. you know, Christopher Hitchens or right. you know, somebody like that. This is a child of Israel, mm -hmm. and that places upon me a different responsibility yeah, as an evangelizer. Right. No, quite right. I remember in Chicago years ago being part of a Jewish-Catholic dialogue, and one of the Jewish interlocutors said to me, remember, when we hear the word evangelization, we often think genocide. Now, exactly. fair to evangelization, no, but understandable given that history. And so, right, I go in there with, with a hammer and say, unless you become a, a Catholic tomorrow, uh, it's not respecting that rather dark and complex history, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about uh, Dorothy Day and Peter Morin. Uh, oh, so I would you, love to. 
You are the director of a, a Catholic worker farm. I, yes. I, I've been fascinated for years by the Catholic worker movement. Delight in the Dorothy Day seems to be moving now uh, with renewed vigor toward canonization. Uh, a line I've quoted a lot over the years from Peter Morin is, um, we've taken the dynamite of the church, <laughs> we've put it in hermetically sealed containers and sat in the lids. It's time to blow up the dynamite of the church. Uh, talk about enemies of a beige Catholicism, uh, Dorothy Day and Peter Morin. Uh, but the other thing about Dorothy Day, I think people often overlook, is yes, the social activism, yes, the radicalism, yes, transform society according to the gospel. Here's a woman of daily mass and benediction and rosary and spending half her life on her knees in church. The, the integration of the, the spiritual, the orthodox, the, the theological with the radical social commitment. That's a beautiful thing that's often missing yeah. today. Uh, very much so, and she's, uh, especially Dorothy Day, most people have never even heard of Peter Morin. Yeah. Uh, they've heard of Dorothy Day, and it's usually just to dismiss her. Oh, she was yeah, that communist, communist, she was that Marxist, and, and, yeah. and she was that liberal. Uh, and nothing could be further from the truth. Not only was she a completely orthodox Catholic, she even bought into all of the sexual teachings. Of the, yeah. She accepted the teaching on contraception. Yeah. And, 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 you know, pre Certainly abortion. Abortion, and, yeah. extramarital right. sex. And she, she was all in. In that regard. Uh, so there, there could not have been a more devout Catholic out there. But yes, she was a radical in terms of the, 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 the she's known for the social justice things because she was more radical yeah. about that. Her, her Orthodox Catholicism, in other ways, fed that right. and was the underpinning for it. But that's where she flourished. And in particular, the dynamite that Peter Morin is talking about. Yeah, how would you name that? Uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. It is the key to understanding both Peter and Dorothy. To understand that they truly believed that the Sermon on the Mount had been clericalized. Mm -hmm. It had been cordoned off into the realm of the councils of evangelical yeah. perfection, that we expected monks and people in religious orders to live. We don't even expect diocesan clergy to live it, because mm -hmm. they're not taking those evangelical counsels. The rest of us are on the way of the commandments. Mm -hmm. Now that is a church teaching. There is a distinction to be made between commandments and counsels. But when you clericalize that distinction and professionalize it, yeah. then you run the risk of undermining the entire universal call to holiness of every single lay person that is out there. And that was their dynamite, calling lay people to live the Sermon on the Mount yeah. in very... Ra now, she was accused, of course, of being a kind of a rigorist, especially in terms of her pacifism. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that's true. I, I just think she was a prophet. She was a dynamic and powerful and charismatic personality. And, and she truly believed that living the Sermon on the Mount was, was indeed possible. And, and uh, like Francis of Assisi, many centuries before. Yeah. She was misunderstood even by some in the hierarchy. Yeah. And so you're saying that the standard sort of spirituality at the time was the laity, they can handle the commandments, but it's for the spiritual athletes can do the councils. Yeah, so I like for that, the spiritual athletes. Bishops yes. and the priests and the nuns and the monks can yes. do the poverty, chastity, obedience. Give me an example, therefore, of for a layperson, those three councils, so poverty, chastity, obedience. Uh, I, my feeling is, in light of Dorothy Day, gosh, they're needed today. As, as a public witness. Um, but talk about that. Talk about, what does that look like for a lay person to, to live those? Oh, uh, you know, this is a question I get all the time in emails from so many lay yeah. people that read my blog saying, okay, a former student of mine uh, read my, some article I wrote on Dorothy Day, and he wrote to me and said, chap, that's all great, but I have five kids and yeah. a golden doodle, so right. how in the heck <laughs> right. can I live this if I have five kids and a golden doodle? So I, I, you know, I wrote a blog post called that. And, and, and it's a hard question to answer simply because, you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all yeah, right. situation. Everyone's vote. But I'll say this. Yeah. With regard to poverty, I think we definitely need to return, and my wife and I try to live this. We often fail, but we try to, to just simply an affirmation. Uh, it's a baseline that you need to live as simple a material existence as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. All right, have a TV, but you don't necessarily need to have the 800-inch television. Yeah, right. You know, get yourself a smaller one. Uh, and so on, you know, buy clothes at thrift stores yeah. and that kind of thing. And I know that is so cliche, you know. No, just but it's, it's live, making but it's, it concrete. The way but it's, it's a helpful. concrete thing. Yeah. You know, if, if you don't need three cars, don't have three cars. If you don't need, and then to live well underneath your means. And it's not just therefore to, in a sense, live a kind of superficial poverty, because poverty is also an internal disposition of the spirit. 
It should therefore free you from attachments. That's, that's yeah. the key here. Yeah. Free you from an attachment to the hamster wheel of American mm -hmm. consumerism. To get off that hamster wheel of American consumerism by living vastly simpler material lives frees you up to have a positive disposition towards prayer. And that, to me, is the absolute key, whether you're talking about obedience and chastity. As lay people, and I am preaching to my, I'm a leper among lepers, Lay people need to develop more powerful yeah. spiritual lives, more powerful prayer lives. Dorothy Day, a prime example of how to do that. Right? Absolutely. So if the only thing that you do is to divest yourself of all the encumbrances that impede your focusing on the one thing necessary, then you have achieved the goal of Dorothy and Peter. Yeah. Okay. You have achieved the goal of at least seeking after holiness as the first thing in your life and not the third, fourth, fifth thing, or worse, a compartmentalized yeah. thing. I think the universal call to holiness is still a largely untaught and unrealized vision of That's Vatican it. II. Uh, you know, I would agree with many would say we tended to clericalize the laity or to draw the laity into official church positions, and nothing wrong with that in itself. But the Vatican II vision was far more dramatic and radical than that. Bring the lumen to the gentas, and how do you do it? Well, partially, yes, through bishops and priests and clear teaching yeah. and sanctification. But the seculum, right, the, the secular realm, that's the realm of the laity. And to bring those councils out into the, you know, the legal realm, the political realm, the realm of entertainment, the realm of business and finance and investment and all that, that's where the dynamite goes off, right? That's that is the dynamite. Yeah, uh, the dynamite is first and foremost living the Sermon on the Mount. But in a secondary way, I often tell people, the problem with Vatican II wasn't that it was too radical. The problem is that its implementation was actually not radical enough. Right. Because yeah. that dynamite sitting there is the, in a sense, Vatican II was a missionary council, as you have That's said many times. Cardinal George, and therefore, yeah. by definition, it's a lay council. Yeah. It's a. It's, yeah. It is a. It is a calling out. It is a cri de cour from the church saying to lay people, we want you, finally, to, in a sense, pursue holiness and bring it out into the world. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, now training a cadre of door knockers yeah. to go out and throw catechisms in the door, say bye, and, and walk <laughs> yeah. away. Yeah, you got, a, you got the truth now, now I'm out of here. Um, it's being salt and light and being and there's, leavened. There's and... a great article in the, I don't know if you read Church Life Journal out of Notre mm -hmm. Dame. It's yeah. a great, great thing. Yeah. Uh, and there was a great article there by Tim O'Malley recently, who, who I really like. And he was, in a sense, uh, I can't think of the name of the German author, but there, there's a book there that the, the German author says that what characterizes the modern world, it's, it's chief problem, the number one reason why people come disaffiliated from the church. Our number one motif as a culture is control and management. Mm -hmm. Control and management. And insofar as the church has simply become a part of this thing that helps us control and manage our life, people are actually going to to be somewhat disaffiliated from it. You have to, in a sense, develop what the German author calls resonances. Mm -hmm. The church has to have a resonant sort of power that when people get close to it, they vibrate too. There's an attraction, there's an attraction there. So as the late great Lorenzo Albacetti said, the first mm -hmm. thing that a Catholic needs to be is human, in a Christian way, of course, yeah. but human. And if you are human in this Christocentric way, you will resonate, you will vibrate the world. And, 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 and the resonance will, will I, I can't recommend that article by Tim O'Malley more, it's, it's fantastic. And I think it puts its finger on why people are disaffiliating from the church. And therefore it puts its finger on, on the manner of our evangelization. Yeah, we talked about poverty there as one of the councils. I often think about obedience. You've talked to priests. A lot of priests will say, you know, you think celibacy is the toughest of the, of the promises. But actually, over the years, obedience becomes maybe the toughest <laughs> of the promises because yeah. handing your will over to someone else and saying, I, I'll do what you tell me to do. Um, you, you know, when you, you place your hands in the hands of your ordaining bishop and you're like a you're like a vassal in the Middle Ages and you're saying, you know, you're yeah. my Lord and I will do what you and your successors want. That's an extraordinarily, when you're 26, you don't quite realize it, but as you move through life, you do. But what strikes me is today in our culture, there is such a premium on autonomy. And I determine and I decide and I decide even who I am about my own body, my own gender, my own sexuality. I decide everything. And so lay people that go out into the world saying, no, I listen to a higher voice. I'm obeying, I'm not my ecclesial yeah. superior the way a, a priest does, but I'm obeying 
Christ. I'm obeying the church. I'm, I'm listening to a higher voice beyond my own autonomy. Yes. And if, if, if every single Catholic in the United States clearly lived that way, let people see what that looks like. Talk about the resonance. Talk about exploding the dynamite and setting off an earthquake in our society, which is drunk on autonomy as it is on material things, you know, hence yeah. the poverty. Um, and then maybe I'll let you talk about chastity for lay people well, and the power that can have. I think this is uh, an unaddressed topic today. But I, I want, before I get ahead, to the chastity yeah. thing, I want to say, too, that the whole thing about autonomy is also the flip side of that management and control. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And when right. you say, I adhere to a higher authority, by the way, the whole debate about communion for politicians would go away if, 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 if all Catholics lived yeah. in that resonant way. Yeah. Okay. But chastity. I'm just going to say it right out loud, which is that uh, this is a problem today in marriages, and especially with men. Yeah. It has to do with pornography. Mm-hmm. Okay, it is rampant in our society. Yep. Multi-billion dollars. I don't industry. want to get bogged down in a huge conversation, but everybody knows it's out there. Everybody knows that it's a massive problem. You're a, you're a priest and a bishop. I know a lot of priests. They say, yep, it's something that nobody wants to talk about, mm-hmm. but it is the elephant in the living room. Yep. And it is destroying an entire generation of young people. When the I young st- people, right. When I st- still taught at DeSales University, I always made a point in my classes, no matter what the topic, to spend one lecture series on this topic. And the guys, would, their baseball caps would go down, mm-hmm. and the girls yep. be listening. <laughs> and then afterwards, a steady stream of students into my office. Yep. The guys, Dr. Chap, I have a problem. Mm-hmm. And the girls, Dr. Chap, my boyfriend does nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and this is the image of sexuality that an entire generation of people, not just in our culture, but around the world, the pornification of the world. Massively destructive. It's huge. It's satanic. And see, I don't call many things satanic. This is No, no, I I quite agree. And our generation was spared because we didn't have the internet when we were coming of age. And so it did not have the addictive potential. But I I saw that, heck, in in my years involved in education, even seminary education. There's a generation that grew up with the internet. And the first use of pornography, they can be 11 or 12, addicted by 14. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a massively problematic thing. I find, too, that if I bring it up in a, a preaching context, you know when you're, you're public speaking, and you know in, in a second when the audience has started listening to you. Oh, yes, you do. Even though there's, no one's making explicit noise, but there's, yeah. some, there's a quality of the listening. The, the kinetic atmosphere in the room Suddenly changes. Suddenly when you talk about yes. pornography, everyone's listening, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so the living out of chastity among the laity. Yeah, I think if Dorothy and Peter were alive today, that this would also, they would tie it as they often did to, to issues of social justice as well. Right. Because I think pornography is a social justice yep. issue as, uh, as well as simply a, a chastity issue. It's, it is socially destructive, personally destructive, hellishly destructive on 800 different levels. Mm-hmm. And it is therefore a, a public health issue uh, we talk about COVID, 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 and yet we have these other public health issues, and it is a public health issue. And I think Dorothy and Peter would approach it from that perspective as well. They wouldn't be, you know, right. no, naughty, naughty, naughty boy. Right. They would approach it systemically at its roots. You know, a hero of mine is Reynold Hillenbrand. You know that name? He was yeah. the rector of Mundelein back yeah, in the way, 30s way, and yeah. 40s. Hillenbrand shaped the generation of, of great Chicago priests, most of whom were old men when I became a priest, so I knew some of them. But Hillenbrand, as you know, I mean, brought Dorothy Day to Mundelein to speak to the students in the 40s, was radical social justice guy, bring the liturgy out into the streets and, you know, yeah. make a better society, all of that stuff, which made him in the eyes of most people a liberal in the 40s and 50s. The 60s come along, and Paul VI issues Humanae Vitae, and now the somewhat older um, Reynold Hillenbrand supports it ardently. His, I got this from their own mouths. A lot of his followers, these priests that loved him, they, they went to visit him at his rectory. And they said, Hilly, they called him Hilly, what's the matter here? I mean, what are you doing? And don't you realize you're siding with the conservatives yeah. now and yeah. you're undermining yeah. all your work? And I said, what did Hillenbrand say? And they said, he named each of our... <laughs> personal problems. He knew each one of them and then said, get out of here. And I had a very interesting story because they often told it as, yeah, poor old Hilly, you know, kind of lost his way at the end. But as I've gone through this project more and more, I think, no, 
old Hilly saw something, and it's exactly what you talked about, the link between uh, social justice and things like our sexual ethics. Yeah. It's not like a public-private distinction or, or you know, liberal-conservative. It's all of a piece. And Hillenbrand said, look, the yes. popes were for these things. Read, you know, Quadro J.Z. Moano and so on. The popes were for all that. And now the pope is for this. And, and I'm a papal man. And it's one of the reasons why John Paul's theology of the body is so important yes, here as right. well. Because the, 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 the deal is this. If all you have, uh, not to get too technical here, but if all you have is a sort of old-fashioned natural law perverted faculty mm -hmm. moral theology, if here's what's wrong with yeah. these various practices, uh, you're, not, you're going to appeal to a certain sort of white-knuckled, ascetical yeah. approach to things. You, you tie it into the sacramentality of our bodies which ties it into the iconic sacramentality of the, the entire world. Yeah. And this is the way that we resonate with this world. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, St. Paul. Now you're onto something because you're integrating it with the message of social justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and if Dorothy and Peter were alive today, they would be right on board with Humanae Vitae, right? Well, she did loop past Humanae Vitae, and see, she did yeah. support it. But I think that's fascinating, and it's not well known or articulated no. today. And it's part of that falling asunder that happened after the council. What was somewhat integrated prior to the council falls apart into the liberal and conservative branches. You know, So people fussing along about the liturgy and all this, well, those are the conservatives, and we liberals are out, you know, social justice in the streets. They were held together in the minds of, of the uh, Ellen Brands and Dorothy Days and well, yes. Thomas Mertens and all those all people. All the peace. So that's, that, I think, is a key. And what's interesting is that uh, modern hyper-progressives who are all into intersectionality right. understand this perhaps on a, yeah. on a, in a, on yeah. a wrong-headed way, but they understand the connectedness of all these issues. You, know, yeah. you can't be against this and all, but for this because yeah. it's all part of a package. I could talk to you all day. We're running short on time. I do want to talk to you about this, though, the whole question of, of natural law and its relation to uh, church and politics and society. One way that the debate's going today, you know, there's kind of a more neoconservative approach to this question mm -hmm. of trying to use the natural law to find place for the church within a liberal, you know, political environment. You've got integralists today who are calling very strongly for, you know, yeah. the church's sort of uh, presiding role over the totality of society. Uh, I know you've written about natural law, how properly to read it, it must be read theologically, not simply philosophically. You're uneasy with abstracting a sort of philosophical distillate of natural law and then using that within a liberal framework. Maybe say a little bit about that whole nexus of questions. Oh, okay. Easily. I, I think it's very, uh, like you said, it's too abstract and it's too disincarnate. Uh, it, it doesn't take into enough, I think, consideration of the affective domain yeah. uh, of human beings as well. And therefore, I'm obviously supportive of natural law moral yeah. theory. Any sound Catholic theologian has to be. But it cannot, it cannot get so abstracted from theological moorings that it becomes a kind of an ideological, political sort of yeah. I, you know, thing where all of a sudden you've got a sort of Whig Thomist alliance with mm -hmm. neoconservative politics in the United States. There's obviously prudential reasons for some of that. I'm not here to call anybody out. But it makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It really does because I don't find it evangelical enough, eschatological enough, theological enough. And that's why any use, I, I, I'm often, here's the thing, I'm often left cold by all this, that well, natural law is a sort of neutral language yeah, right. that we can use to discourse with, yeah. I, you know what, call me a heretic, send me to bed without supper, I don't know, I haven't, <laughs> I, I, I don't buy that. Yeah. I, I don't buy that natural law is neutral because it means nothing unless you first have faith in God. I mean, it's about our ordering toward God, finally, the natural yeah. teleology. If you don't things. already accept why, yeah. the ordered teleologies of the natural world are normative for us. Yeah. If you don't accept that, the natural law theorizing is not neutral. It's part of a theistic package, as far yeah. as you can see. And it, and it kind of is. So I have no issue with that because I'm a theist. And... It's a great way of teaching moral theology in many ways to, to believers. But used as a neutral language in the yeah. public sphere to dialogue with seculars, to me, seems to cede too much to the seculars. Right. I mean, might it be used, Thomas talks about philosophy as a monoduxio, right? It's a leading by the hand. I can yes. use philosophy to kind of yes. bring someone toward the exactly. light of revelation. Yeah. So could this sort of distillate, this philosophical distillate of it, be used to draw people toward a more objective sense of morality and so on? 
But I'd be with you, too, that if we stay at that level, we're not going to be very persuasive. You know, Stanley Hauerwas, maybe uh, you know, the liveliest Christian theologian in the last 50 years in terms yeah. of writing, has often said, look, have we convinced the society with our appeals to natural law? And his answer was no. And uh, along the lines you're suggesting, a more kind of robustly biblical and Christian take. I remember Hauerwas testifying years ago before Congress about abortion. And they asked him, you know, what's your argument against abortion? And he said, Christians don't kill their children. <laughs> and they said, well, no, but we're looking for, you know, an argument. Something that, we can use in the legal sphere. And he said, Christians don't kill their children. That's my argument. And, but it relates to what we said earlier about the church's role in the world. Um, yeah. We're not there to sort of bring ourselves under the aegis of the world, but rather to be in the world as leaven and light and salt and transformative. So... Yeah, I mean, I have a great respect for Hauerwas and that whole sort of tradition with people like Yoder and so on. Yeah, right. uh, I think you do, I mean, and I love, he's a character, right? He's a character. Uh, yeah. He is an absolute character, and I love that answer. But you also, you're absolutely correct, you know, I am a Catholic after all, and there is a role to be played by philosophy. Yeah, right. And, and there is a role to be played for a kind of intermediary logic yeah. between hard evangelical truth and just pure secularism. So I'm not here to disparage that, but when it, when it, is, when it becomes simply that right. is my issue. Yeah. And as far as integralism goes, that's a hugely complicated topic. You've got Patrick Deneen and David yeah. Schindler and these guys out there right now. And then you've got the real hard integralists. The fact is, all states are confessional. Yeah, all there's, states there's are integralist. Ultimate value that they're trying yeah, to embody. I mean, they're, they're, right. but and so this no, my biggest thing would be that there's no such thing as a purely neutral state vis-a-vis yeah. -vis ultimate questions. Uh, and there's always a theological underpinning. Uh, all, uh, in some all, way. all politics right. is ultimately theological. Yeah, uh, in, in my point of view and in the view of others. And therefore, we're not talking about really a confessional state versus a non-confessional state. We're talking about different kinds of confessional states. But, you know, a Catholic confessional state is impossible by definition without Catholics. And so in a lot of ways, the debate right now in the United States, I, I think, is a little bit, it might be interesting on an academic level, but yeah. we are perhaps uh, <laughs> centuries away from yeah. any, any hopeful possibility of, I'm not certain I would necessarily want a overtly Catholic confessional state anyway, but we probably don't have time to talk about that. Yeah. How about the last couple of minutes? Um, these are sort of more open-ended, you know, speculative type questions, but, and maybe we've covered it already in a way, but what, what's bugging you most right now in the Catholic Church in America? Seriously, here's what's really the matter. What would you put your finger on? Uh, I would say indifferentism. Yeah. Uh, and, and, of course, that can come in all kinds of different colors. And, and, I, and I say that because I feel it in myself. Uh, like I said, I, I, a lot of, I say this a lot in my blogs. I'm a leper preaching to other lepers. Yeah. The reason why I sometimes can put my finger on something is because I, I ha I'm infected with the same bacillus. And, and the fact is, the modern age in which we live, American culture in which we live, as Berdaev and uh, mm -hmm. Augusto del Noche call it, the, the, the bourgeois mind. The bourgeois mind places creature comforts mm -hmm. above all else. And you may not say that to yourself consciously, but as we order our lives, as Peter Berger, the sociologist, I think it was Peter Berger, said, they order the plausibility structures of our existence. And those plausibility stru structures say to us that religious matters are something to be cordoned off over here. Yeah compartmentalized, and therefore they ultimately die because Christianity cannot be compartmentalized yeah. and live. It's like a lover. You can't stuff your wife in a closet. <laughs> you know, sorry, hon, but you can't stuff your wife in a closet. You know, you, you, she's, your, she's your partner, and the same with Christianity, and yet too many Catholics, Christians in, in the United States, treat the faith as this compartmentalized thing that eventually leads to the beige Catholicism that yeah. you have been talking about. I know that sounds kind of boilerplate and cliche, but that is no, my no, number that, one concern. And I would put it as a, a spiritual boredom or... Um, same, same thing. Charles yeah. Taylor's, you know, the buffered self. This, yeah. this weird anomaly that in all of human history, maybe we're the first major civilization that has said, I can live my life and find happiness in abstraction from God or, or some reference yeah. to the transcendent. Yeah. It is a weird moment. It's a bizarre moment. And what I've noticed, especially in younger people, is the damage it's doing 
because the, the boredom is, is killing their souls off, you know? Yeah. And, and they are buying into this, but then they're making up for it. Talk pornography and drugs and all these artificial stimulants and so on yeah. is trying to, to fill the void. But see, we've been so darn bad, we religious leaders, at articulating the transcendent and making it compelling. You know, I had that dialogue a couple months ago with uh, with Jordan Peterson, and that was great, by the way. It was well, great. I, I, I love that dialogue. I appreciate it very much. But uh, I said to him, "Look, you're opening up the Bible in a way that we've not been able to do." And he's doing it by by using a patristic method. I would say he's he's showing the kind of psychological, you know, moral dimension of the Bible. Well, that's just that's the beginning of it. But heck, he's he's drawing these giant audiences of younger people. Yeah. So we've been pretty bad at overcoming the, the the boredom. We haven't blown up the dynamite of the church. We haven't presented it in a way that's beautiful and compelling. Well, you've read my blog, so you know, and I hate to bring this up, there have been a few moments in there where I've been a little critical of the bishops. <laughs> <laughs> a few <laughs> you moments, know, yeah. <laughs> you know, few, just a couple of moments in there, I'm critical of the bishops, but it's on this score. You know, I know lots of individual bishops, like Bishop Jim Conley in Lincoln, I yeah, went to sure. seminary with, great guy, and so forth. You know, I know a lot of great bishops, so I, when I trash the bishops here and there, it's on this score, I like your thing about Taylor, the buffered self, because that's exactly yeah. right. But you know what, not to be therefore too hard on the bishops, the fact is, this is not a clerical moment. Yeah. The reason why Jordan Peterson is so powerful is precisely that he's not a he's cleric. Not a cleric yeah. And this is what yeah. I mean about the dynamite of the universal call to holiness. This is what Vatican II envisioned. That if you really want a powerful theological critique of certain sociological problems in our society, talk to a believing sociologist. I mean, that's not going to come from a bishop unless he too is a sociologist, yeah. okay? Or a historian, or a believing biologist, or, a, you know, you get my point. The, the interface is on the personal level in the heart and soul that intersects right through the heart of individual believers who have competencies in, in all of these, and it's vastly more that's powerful. That's Vatican II. That's what Vatican that II is Vatican wanted. That is Vatican II. That's, that's what the wanted. dynamite of the church. That's the, the yeah. universal call of holiness. But as I said, I do think it's not been realized. No. That we, it, we just stuffed it everybody got in the sanctuary. It got derailed. And see, in some ways, the, the battles we talked about of the, of the progressives and the rad trads, that's a function of the failure of, of the central vision. It, it's the failure to articulate it. Um, yeah, th that's what I would put my finger on as maybe the greatest concern. It's a spiritual yeah. boredom that is, we've met the enemy and it's us. I mean, to some degree, we're responsible for it. Um, I hate ending on a negative note, so let's, the last question. All right. Uh, so what right now for you is the, is the source of greatest hope in the life of the church in our country? I, th I think the source of the greatest hope is the fact that there is an increasing desire among the, the Catholics who get it, let's put it that yeah. way, the Catholics who get it, to form... Uh, I mean, you got Rod Dreher's Benedict option, which I, I like, but I have certain mm -hmm. caveats and issues with. But, you know, and then the term intentional communities are yeah. thrown on that phrase as a cliche. Uh, but I attend an Anglican ordinariate parish, mm. even though I'm a cradle Catholic, uh, mainly because of the intentionality mm -hmm. of the community. They're all converts. Yeah. The liturgy, of course, is beautiful. Uh, but, but that's the thing. My wife and I have never been so nourished by a parish community. And there are little, as George Bush, a thousand points of light. There's a thousand <laughs> points of light out there of parishes that get it. One, yeah. of, the, one of the calumnies, uh, calumny is not the right word, one of the negative sort of stereotypes against Novus Ordo parishes is that they're all dead. Yeah. And there's nothing vibrant going on. Right. That is not true. Of course not. There are all kinds of lively parishes out there where good things are happening. And that gives me hope that as, as we hemorrhage Catholics away from the church, those that remain are forming deeply, deeply yeah. intentional faith communities. Yeah, we're, right. we're not going away. We're, no, we're here right. for the long haul. And yeah. the gospel is true, so it's not going to die. Right. I think that's right. I guess if I answer my own question... Um, I think of our, our Word on Fire ministry over the years, you know, doing the videos and articles and films and so on, I, that it's found an audience to me is a sign of hope. Oh, yeah. Uh, it may be a, a, the most pointed example. I've gone on that Reddit thing, I think three times, called Reddit AMA is Ask Me Anything. And I said, it's like a quadlibital question in the Middle Ages. You just, you just <laughs> go out there and say, and all I've yeah. done each time, I said, I'm a Catholic bishop who loves dialoguing with atheists and non-believers. They don't know who I am. I'm sure 98% of them. But I, I'm a Catholic bishop. And 
Each time I've done it, it's been either the second or third most popular Reddit AMA of the year, up there beyond Bernie Sanders, beyond Jordan Peterson. And again, it's not to say anything about me. They don't know me from Adam. But the fact that a Catholic bishop yeah. makes himself available, and what you hear is, is a deep interest. Now, there's a lot of obscenity and anger, and I get all that. Fine. It's always been there. But, but amidst all that, there's real spiritual interest. Peterson phenomenon, too, to me, is a sign of hope that there are people responding. As, oh, yeah. as a guy gets up in a non-histrionic way, he's a pretty understated fellow, and talks about the Bible, and he's getting millions of people listening. I think that's a sign of, of hope, even amidst some of these uh, struggles we're going through. Yeah, because there's an authenticity there. Yeah. That, that's, that's the key, a profound authenticity. People sniff out inauthenticity in a second. Right. And, uh, yeah, and 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 you have that you have that about you. I'll, so we can end on that note. There. We'll end on that note. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> delighted to talk to you, Larry. It's just uh, we covered a lot of ground, but lots more we could cover. So come oh, yeah. back, please. Oh, I'd love to come back anytime. All right. God bless you. I'm Dr. Anthony Paglarini. I'm Dr. Holly Holly. At the University. I'm Christopher Kaiser, Leah Professor of Philosophy, and, and, and I'm Stacy Tresankos. Todd Warner. Authors I'm an internal medicine Father Stephen Gadbury, a priest of the Diocese of Eden. Well, a very special greeting to all the members of the Word on Fire Institute. Good to be back with you. Imaginative Apologetics is the name of our course overall. In the coming lessons, we'll be looking at what I call the four integral features of the Catholic narrative. Because this whole series is about how we are to evangelize the culture, and it's that Jesus wants us to go out and not be afraid to do just that. Newman enumerates the principles of Christianity principle of dogma we've seen. I teach the literature of the mystical tradition at the Angelicum University. And I